All right, good day to everyone. This is the Skin Science Podcast, and I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, coming to you live from Dallas, Texas. And this is the very first of these podcasts where we aim to investigate everything skin science and dissect it from a scientific perspective, critique it from a consumer perspective, and give insight from an industry perspective. And with me in the studio, I have the lovely Angela McDonald, who I am blessed to count as one of my dear friends and colleagues, and who will be with me all the time to try and take my scientific jargon and make it down into little bite-sized pieces because as she's helped me uh, realize throughout the years, not everybody is a scientist, although many people are interested in what makes your skin tick. Angela, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. I'm thrilled to be here, Thomas. Thank <laughs> and you how long invitation. have we been working together? Oh, my goodness, Thomas. <laughs> Some people say far too long, Oh no, not, honestly, not long but... enough, Angela. <laughs> not long enough. All right. And so I also wanted to uh, welcome our honored guest today, having joined us from satellite or Zoom, I guess, uh, our very first guest of the podcast, a board certified dermatologist specializing in laser, cosmetic surgical and aesthetic dermatology. She's a medical educator and a highly respected and sought after media personality. She's a clinical associate professor of dermatology at NYU and the owner of a premier medical and aesthetic dermatology clinic in the Upper East Side of New York City, a devoted wife, a mother of two, and one of my favorite people in the world, and someone Aww. I call my friend, the always lovely Dr. Doris Day. How are you, Doris? Great, thank you so much. That was such a beautiful introduction, and the feeling is absolutely mutual. Well, I'm not a mother of two, but... Um... <laughs> Well, not that, the feeling, not the okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just joking with you. So Doris, um, you know, uh, you know, it, you know, there's a reason why, uh, we wanted you to not, it's not just your fashion sense and it's just not your, your, your educational, uh, style that, uh, has, uh, made me, uh, feel close to you over the years. Um, but it's also the fact that uh, you and I can have discussions and on many different topics when, you know, as far as political, medicine, you know, personal, and uh, we can we can ad agree or disagree. And it's always a great conversation. So uh, it's my pleasure to have you here today. But Thank also, um, as the two of you may or may not know, uh, one of my skin science passions is a little topic that we call the microbiome. <laughs> You don't say. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been talking to both of your ears off uh, for the last, you know, probably good part of a decade on this topic. And um, I thought that it would make a great topic for the first podcast because uh, it's something that I'm very passionate about, something that we at Crown are very uh, focused on right now. And uh, I thought, you know, this would be a great way to kind of segue into this type of a podcast. Um, Doris, uh, you knew you and I have been talking about this for a while, and we have a little project that you and I are working on uh, that we won't get into too much detail about, but we're writing a book on this subject. And <laughs> so I thought it would be wonderful to have you on so that we can kind of uh, talk about some of the things that we're, we're noting as we're writing, uh, some of the, the, the topics that we're seeing, uh, you as a clinician uh, and me as a scientist, and then Angela as a consumer, all of us really as consumers. Um, but Doris, what are some of your thoughts about while we're getting started on this topic? What are some of your thoughts that kind of jump out to you? Uh, what you're seeing as far as a clinician and a consumer? Well, you know, I, it's such a great topic, and you and I have so much in common in that. Just over the years, our passions about skin rejuvenation, aging, healthy skin have really overlapped, and and from all the different entities we've worked on together, it's really, when we started talking about the microbiome, both of our eyes lit up and, and I feed off of so much that I learned from you. But when I look at patients that I see, I can see there's a dysbiosis. I can see that their skin biome is out of balance. And I look at the products that we use, you know, you think back to decades ago, I don't mean centuries ago, I just mean decades ago, when we used to use x-ray therapy to treat acne. Mm. And I think we're going to look in a not that far in the future where we're going to look back and look at antibiotics or other skin conditions and go, how did we ever do that? You know, how did we ever use those toxic ingredients that throw the biome off so much? At what cost did we try to get rid of this P. acne's bacteria instead of instead of looking at the, the microbes in the skin and on the skin and even in the gut to some extent? And think about how we can rebalance them, not wipe them out. 
So right, right now we have a take no prisoners approach to skincare <laughs> and we're really in the process, maybe even accelerating aging, increasing skin cancer, but seeing in the short run, smoother skin and saying, okay, that's success. And it doesn't feel like success to me. And even some of the new treatments that knock out the sebaceous glands, I keep thinking, right. we kind of need those glands. Why do we want to knock them out? 100%. We may want to balance or control them, but you don't want to kill them because as you get older, your skin's going to get drier and you'll age faster. So there's so much that I see that I can tell is wrong, but we need to we need to be able to say how to do it right. And that's where we're we're just in the infancy of what we can do. And I love exploring this, but we're just in the infancy of it. Right. And a lot of those uh, methodologies are, you, you mentioned x-ray, you mentioned, uh, what else did you mention there? Uh, antibiotics. Antibiotics. Those are all things that definitely have a place in medicine, right? They all yeah, are good sure. things. It's just that, and this is one of the things that you've taught me over the years, is that it's not that we're doing things wrong, it's that we're learning more. We're learning better. We're evolving in our in, in every sense of the word. Science evolves. You know, scientists, what we believe to be dogma years ago, we now know some of those are not correct because we've advanced our technologies to be able to look deeper into the skin. To, you know, 16S sequencing for uh, looking at the microbiome has opened up huge doors for us and, and allowed us to see things we just never would have been able to see before. Um, so I think that that's the point that... Uh, I think is is exciting for me is that we're just understanding, you know, years ago they used leeches to bleed people and it's not, we still use leeches, right? We use leeches for microvascular surgery um, because of the uh, anticoagulants they secrete. Um, so we, there's all these tools that we're not saying throw them out. We're just saying we need to reassess how we use them. We looked at germs as being all bad. Right. And when, and so our, our instinct is that if you have microbes in the skin, we must get rid of them. And it's really only recently that we're starting to realize that some of them are not only helpful, but they may even be necessary for life. That's right. And I think we're just starting to learn these things. And it came from the idea of learning that we have microbes. And for there was a while that people thought if you can't see it, it doesn't exist. And so they didn't even think you should wash your hands before doing surgery. I mean, there was a time when this happened, they didn't understand how people died of disease. And now we understand that we have a, a host and a range of microbes, and we kind of have to come around and, and balance out and say, well, some of them are good. Even some strains of bad microbes have opposite strains of good versions of them. So maybe we can create these, these wars. When you look at cancer treatments, we've come so far in that we don't try to wipe out all cells and hope the, the normal cells are dividing slower and so we'll sort of survive the chemotherapy and, mm -hmm. and your body will build back. But what we're learning is that we can now hone the immune system to target cells that are producing inappropriately and return you back to normal, the price you might pay is some autoimmune conditions, but we're, we're curing metastatic melanoma. That right. was a death sentence in a year. And now we're finding that we have patients 10 years out who are perfectly cured with minimal side effects and no chemo. It's all biologics. It's a different type of chemo. And I think as we evolve and we have kind of the body working for itself, we now have to take that to the next level of microbes. And I think it will change the face of skincare and the face of, of medical dermatology and maybe even medicine. A lot of medicines, you know, a lot of the hormones we use are transdermal. Mm -hmm. And so with a patch, you can get delivery of medicines. We may have transdermal delivery of microbes and you may be able to repopulate the gut. Like where we're going with this is, is just the, the ideas are infinite. Yeah, what the sky's the limit. Accomplish. Yeah, the sky's the limit. I'm going to go to yeah. Angela in just a second, but I, I do want to uh, connect a, dot, a couple of dots that you just mentioned there, you know, with cancer and the microbiome. Some of the most exciting things that I've observed as a research scientist is that we've done gene chip analysis, looking at some of the most common microbes that are on our skin. And there's uh, upregulation of human genes that are association with cancer or, you know, or lack of cancer, however you want to look at it, based on the presence or absence of these microbes. And so we have a few uh, researchers out there that are actually showing uh, that there's a huge um, association of certain microbes or lack of certain microbes 
with skin cancers. So uh, you're right, the sky's the limit, and it's a super exciting uh, time we're in as far as the skin microbiome because we, we are kind of in the infancy. We are starting to understand it, um, but there's still a lot more to go. So Angela, from a consumer perspective, what, what jumps out to you? What excites you or what scares you uh, when we talk about the skin microbiome? Because I used to always say to people, you have billions of bacteria on your face, and I think that's awesome. And a lot of times people will grimace because when they hear that, they think that's gross. Um, what's, what's your take? I know you've, and I talked about this a long time. Well, but. and I come from an interesting perspective because I'm not only the target market for our industry, um, but I'm also in the business from, mm -hmm. but from the sales and marketing side of the business. And Thomas, I've worked alongside of you for the last eight years. I've watched as you've worked in your own lab to develop um, the microbiome research um, and, and, and now we all know that that has the, the rights, commercial rights, so that has been acquired by Crown Laboratories. But on the flip side of that, I've also watched from the sales and marketing side of our industry, and, and I know that you and, and Doris have as well, certain products that have leaked into our market that have claimed probiotic, that have used the word probiotic, um, were met with lackluster uh, fanfare, quite honestly, showed lackluster results, quite honestly. Um, so I think from my perspective uh, as a consumer, just a lot of confusion. Right. You hear the word microbiome. Most often, if I were to ask my friends about microbiome, they're immediately going to go to the gut and they're immediately going to go to yogurt. That's mm -hmm. what comes to mind first. Very few go into the skincare side, but when you look at the skincare side of having been in the industry and watch what's going on, um, that, you know, a lot of uh, lackluster ideas and, 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 and response, quite honestly. You know, Thomas, Angela is right because what happens is that they go right to the gut right. and a lot of people who create products try to translate the gut for, to the face and yep. use the same products that are good for the gut thinking it's going to be good for the face. And that creates a lot of misinformation, which is unfortunate. So uh, the gut and the face biomes are very different and or, or maybe even more different than we realize. There may be some overlap and similarities, but we're, we're finding there's things that are on the face, you know, the environment, the pH, all of it is so different that I would expect there to be different biomes in those two, in those two locations and different functions of them, different functionalities. And you know what, the brain may have a biome. We, we're learning that other organs may have their own biomes as well that, that help them function at ideal optimized levels. So we're, we're still learning, but the two areas that we know for sure have biomes are the, the gut and the skin. And in the skin, different parts of the skin are different. It may, we're learning more and more about similarities and differences in different environments, um, different races. There's so much to explore here and we take nothing for granted in this. But one thing is for sure is that just because it's good for your gut doesn't mean if you put it on your face, it's going to be just as good right. or good at all. Right. And I think uh, I think what you're what you are both alluding to here is that there's a disconnect when it comes to what science has found, uh, what what clinicians are implementing, what consumers are expecting, um, you know, and what the industry provides. And I think that disconnect comes from several things. Um, the first thing is education, right? And I think one of the things that I'd like to talk about a little bit later is um, the terminology that we use. You know, are we speaking the same language uh, amongst these different groups? Uh, the, the second thing is um, the, uh, the infrastructure of the industry. I think one of the reasons why they're using the gut uh, microbe philosophy when it comes to skincare is because it's available, Right. And so skincare companies, you know, they're not in it for philanthropic <laughs> reasons. They're there to make money. And so, you know, they want to find ingredients that are cheap so, you know, they can they can make their money. And that is what the yogurt industry has provided for the last what century or whatever. And they have an infrastructure to produce this. They don't have an infrastructure to produce skin relevant strains yet, at least not in mass. And so that's just emerging right now. Um, so that's another disconnect. And then uh, a, another disconnect uh, would also be, um, uh, you, we just mentioned it, now I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but those are, those are two of the, the, the disconnects is the education and the infrastructure. Uh, so let's talk really briefly about education, and I'll think of the other disconnect I had in my mind in a second. But 
Um, so we just finished filming a series uh, of educational videos called Beauty and the Bacteria. And um, we're gonna, we don't have all of them uh, available yet. They, they should be posted within the next couple of months, the last couple of ones. Uh, but uh, we really recommend uh, anybody that's interested in the skin microbiome watch these. And you can watch that on www.beautyandthebacteria.com. And you can also check them out on the Crown Laboratories website. But we really haven't promoted them all that much yet until they're all up. Uh, but we, we, we do think that if you're interested, you should go watch them. And what we try to do with that is to actually bring everybody back to a reset and say, we know that there's a lot of expertise out there. And of course, these were geared towards physician audience, although we, you know, we would, we would definitely say if you are interested, if you're a skin intellectual consumer, uh, you know, or somebody in the industry that's not a physician, you should still, you know, take a look. But we, we said, how do we take a step back as scientists and physicians and say, okay, you know, let's forget what we thought we knew and let's start from scratch. Let's make, let's learn microbiome 101. Let's learn to speak the same language so that when we get into the nitty gritty, the nuances of it, we all are starting from the same place. And that goes back to the terminology. So I think um, both of you have watched at least several of the episodes. And so I thought maybe I'd give you each a chance to kind of give your thoughts on, um, the education overall that's needed and whether this is a good first step, what else we could do to try to educate our peers, our, you know, our colleagues, um, you know, our consumers. Doris, did you want to start? Yeah, I think everyone should watch that series. It's so well done and it's packed with information. I think it actually needs to be watched a few times because there's a lot in it and, and it's, you get so much out of every single episode. So I'm, I'm rewatching it myself actually. And, and I find it very informative and got actually entertaining as well. And there is a lot to understand with the biome and with the products around it, whether it's pre, pro, or postbiotics, um, ideal times to use them, the environment they live in, the formulations, all of it, just understanding the science behind it, what it can do, the, the natural biome of the skin and what we know about it for now. And that it's not just what you see on the surface, it's that having all the pores on your skin and, and each one has its own lining that adds up to way more than just what you see on the surface and understanding all of these different environments, how they function, how to have a healthy biome and how to nurture it, I think is really important. So we have a lot to do with education, both to the public, but also to practicing dermatologists and to researchers and scientists. There's we we may be in the infancy, but it's it, there's a lot of very fast milestones because it's been building for a long time. And now we've hit enough that I think we're at the point where we can have an informed and educated conversation that over time we can grow and build on. But we're at the point now where we we have enough knowledge and insight in order to have an impact on skin health skin structure and skin function to optimize it, rejuvenate it, and prevent against disease and cancer. What do you think, Angela? What do you think about uh, education as a whole around this subject and what we could do better, the series that we, we were putting out? And it's a little bit lofty as far as for a consumer possibly, um, but what are, what are some ways we think that we can better get a, a connect uh, amongst the different groups. And well, and you know, this is a, a, a something that's near and dear to my heart because after a career in sales and marketing, I've switched gears a bit and now I dedicate my days at Crown Aesthetics to education globally um, for our division. And, um, you know, I think the Beauty and the Bacteria series, you're right. The first couple of, once you get past the introduction module, the episode that is, you get into a couple of lofty scientific uh, microbiome, um, episodes and I would say just for the average person just hang on because once you get past that and that's all really important information to know you really start getting a firm education on exactly what Doris just said the skin microbiome what is it is it what you think it is and it's way more than you think it is um, the what does probiotics really mean and prebiotics and postbiotics these are all words that consumers are hearing on a daily basis but don't really understand don't have a certainly don't have a deep understanding of what they are and certainly not as they relate to the skin. 
And I think in terms of education, you know, we're going to be looking from an industry perspective, we're going to be looking at the, the Dr. S- Dr. Doris days of the world and, mm-hmm. and really leaning on them because they have the trust of their patients. And, you know, she has spent a lot of time educating herself. And when she goes to her patients and, and lays out a story of, I've switched gears a little bit, and here's why, it's that trust level of, of, of allowing them to, to move into a new era of skin care. Um, and, and so we're going to really be looking to, to physicians to help carry the load of that education um, to the consumer level. Because it is. It's a, it's a lofty subject. It's a high science subject. I don't know. I mean, Doris, you would know best, you know, when is the last time we've looked for a paradigm shift in skincare, like we're looking at, uh, you know, we're staring down at the moment. Can you recall a time? No, you know, it's not only have we not looked, but we're resistant to it, Mm. is that we were very comfortable with the way we're practicing. And to have a paradigm shift is going to take a lot of of discussion and encouraging and, and actually backlash. It, I, I can already feel that the general community is going to say this is this is quackery and it's not real science and we're going to have a lot of work to do to convince other doctors because there's a lot of money behind the products that exist and there's a lot of push from from pharma to continue prescribing in the same way and for us to do what we're doing so this shift is going to be very slow and it's going to be in as a niche in the beginning until it's so proven that people can't and then they'll they'll it'll eventually do it but it's going to take a long time and when i think about my patients and what they want on the one hand they do want to understand they do like hearing in a language they can understand what they should be doing but in the end they want a prescriptive not necessarily a prescription to go to the pharmacy but they want to be told this is what you do in the morning, this is what you do at night, and then they want to see the results relatively quickly. So there's a lot of pressure to to have an impact and to be able to give them advice that they can act on. It has to be actionable, it can't just be interesting. And if it's not actionable, then you lose your audience. So I think that's the consumer point of view that you might be seeing, Angela, that that may be a struggle in the beginning because some of this, you could see some results right away, but some of it is you just have better skin over time. And that's gonna take, like you said, a lot of trust of the patient to say, I'm gonna follow this and and I believe I'm gonna see a difference. And then over time, just have that come through. 100%. And um, you know, I think that's one of the frustrations I think is because it's hard to be prescriptive when the industry really has not produced a lot of uh, choices, right? There's not a whole lot of choices out there that, now you, you do have some major players like Dove that are you know, putting out soaps and such that they call microbiome gentle. Uh, and you, you do have you know, companies putting out things that are called probiotic or prebiotic. The, the real question is, there's no, is whether there is any yet gut check as to or red face test or whatever you want to call it to what makes something microbiome gentle, what makes something probiotic, what makes something prebiotic. And so let me read a quote that was uh, actually by one of your, your, your peers, Doris. It was a dermatologist. And I won't put the name out there because I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus. But, um, you know, I think it's very interesting because it speaks to this whole kind of um, resistance to a paradigm shift, whether and I don't think it's the, the shift itself that's the resistance. It's more of this disconnect we're talking about, not knowing the right terminology, not having the right infrastructure in place to actually be prescriptive. And so here's here's the quote. The quote is, quote, live bacteria in skincare is overrated. More so, it's not even practical to have them because anytime you're looking at a cleanser, a moisturizer, or a cream, there's preservative in there. And there's no way a living bacteria is in that same product. So basically, the quote has two different, uh, t- uh, two different parts. The first one is that live bacteria in skin- skincare is overrated. And then the second part is that it's just simply not practical because of the way that skincare is formulated. So Doris, w- w- give me your reaction to that, those two different um, parts of that quote. And what the takeaway is, like, how do we be, how are we going to be prescriptive with that kind of sentiment out there? Yeah, you know, it's unfortunate because 
when when you have doctors who adamantly go out and they're they're known physicians who adamantly go out and say things like that, then people just write it off. So on the one hand, it may be somewhat overrated if you're using the wrong probiotics or if you don't have a good formula, it could be overrated. But in general, I think that there's a lot we can do with the pre, pro, and postbiotics in skincare that can have a huge impact. And, and Thomas, you've done a great job of showing this to be true in both your research and in products. So it, it's, it's, it's only overrated if you don't have a product that works. And I can say that for any product, all products are overrated. You know, it's like, does that make sense? Or products that aren't right for you are overrated. So I think overrated is an overrated word here. <laughs> and the second point about the preservatives, that's if you choose preservatives that are going to knock out the, the ingredients in the product. Right. But when you create a formula and you test it, then it is active and it is effective. And so the pres preservatives don't knock it out. And even some preservatives may actually preserve the, the, the biotics that are in there and right. preserve the formula and make it even better. So it, it doesn't make sense to me if you have a product that doesn't have any live ingredients then yes, the preservative should make sure that there are no live ingredients because anything in there is going to be a contaminant and you should knock it out. And that's what I would want that preservative to do. But if I'm creating a formula that has live microbes that have a specific purpose or derivatives of it, then I'm going to create a a preservative for that formula that's designed to maintain what I create. And yes, it's work to do that, but it can be done and you've proven that it can be done. So you just need to know the source that you're getting your product from and trust that source. So I, I don't agree with the statement because I think broad generalizations are often dangerous in that way. And again, it's this shift of coming into a new type of product that's supporting your skin and that has an impact that is going to replace a lot of other things out there that you're going to get pushback like this from. And we, we just have to be careful and, and just keep whispering, whispering, whispering till we get to a roar, till we can't be ignored because these products are going to make such a difference that that you'll see it. And, and so people will want to do it more. Right. And there's, there's little nuances to these types of statements that it, yeah. it makes the education that much more important. And for me as a scientist, I tend to do a whole like, um, what's a, a nice way to say it, where I just kind of dump all the information on people because I feel like unless I give all the nuances, people just can't grasp onto it. And this is where, you know, people like Angela are very good at taking all the word salad that I say and, you know, boiling it down to a, a key takeaway. And I'm, I'm trying to do that with the Beauty and the Bacteria series. But um, you know, one of the things that with this, with this one statement here, you know, is they're making a huge assumption that all preservatives do exactly the same thing. There are thousands and thousands of species of bacteria that live in our skin. And are we assuming that all preservative systems kill every single species of bacteria? I mean, that's like saying... I'm going to prescribe one type of antibiotic because it's going to kill everything. Now, yes, there are those antibiotics that do kill a lot of things, right? You know, there's those last stitch ones, but there are certain antibiotics we, we prescribe for different types of bacteria, right? Yeah, well, those preservatives would then kill the bacteria in your skin because you're still, you know, if it's in the product, it's going to be in the product when you apply it to your skin. So then Anything with a preservative should knock out all your P-acnes, all the bacteria in your skin. That So every product should be an anti-acne product, right. you know, if, if that were true. <laughs> that's right? true. So, that's true. Not that way. <laughs> well, that's that's the thing is preservatives are, are unique. There are different preservative systems. They all have their own kind of how they work and what they do. Yeah. And, uh, and the other thing is you can also have anhydrous formulations that don't require preservative systems right. um, because there's no water. So therefore it can't, because we have to remember that preservative systems are not there to be therapeutic. They're there to keep the, sh the formulas shelf stable for a good while so that, you know, a company's not having to like throw out or, you know, stuff and then remake it all the time. It can sit on a shelf for a couple of years, you know, can sit in your medicine cabinet for a couple of years and not get... Uh, mold or bacteria growing in it. And so it's really kind of this kind of, this isn't just a prime example of the disconnect that I see between 
you know, consumers, clinicians, and scientists uh, that are actually making these formulations. And so, I, I so I appreciate. I don't know, do, um, uh, Angela. Do you have any? No, other... that's a good point, Thomas. I think you should talk about it more, as the packaging is going to be a big difference. I think sure. the packaging will form a, a way of preserving the product without being a chemical. Right. And having an airless pump or an hydrous formula where there's no water in it, all of those things can have an impact on the product, even maybe refrigeration. And, and there's so there's lots of different ways that we can preserve a product depending on what's in it and what and how long we expect it to last. That's a great point, actually, the refrigeration point. Uh, because, you know, when we talk about probiotics for the gut, you do have like a section in the grocery store where there's some that are refrigerated, then there's some that aren't. Uh, and there's a lot of great technology that's happening that's allowing us to have more shelf, you know, room temperature, shelf stable, you know, whether we freeze dry the microbes or encapsulate the microbes, there are some, you know, dubious technologies out there. And then there's some good ones as well. Um, but that being said, it comes down to you got to remember that the skincare industry in general um, has been doing one thing for the last, you know, several decades. And they have an infrastructure in place to do it. So any change to that kind of disrupts the whole business model, because if we have to refrigerate, it makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, again, it has to come in, you know, we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Nobody's going to come in and say your favorite topical now has to be thrown into the trash. Although maybe they do. I don't know. It depends on the topical, right? And so, you know, it's one of those things where we all need to just sit down and start to learn about it a little more. And it's going to, it's not going to be a, a light switch, right? It's going to take, you know, some time to kind of implement and, and turn over and already we see companies kind of changing their tune as far as the preservative systems they use the, even the the uh the packaging as you alluded to you know there's a huge push for environmental uh you know uh um what's the word i'm thinking of uh, environmental not friendly pack friendly packaging yes conscious. yeah conscious packaging and these things are not cheap you know and so companies are starting to have to wrestle with what's expedient, what's cheap, what's going to make us money, because most of the companies want to do good. They want to do good by their customers, by the, the earth, but they also have shareholders and such to, to make happy. And so that's the balance that's having to happen within the skincare industry. But from a clinical perspective, we have to make sure that when we look at the physicians that are making comments like these, that we're all understanding the nuances of this new emerging science. And to that point, I wanted to talk really quickly on a couple of items. Well, um, yeah, the first is the terminology that we're using. And, and then we'll get into the actual prescriptive part that you were talking about, Doris, and kind of how we're going to navigate that. But the terminology. So you've mentioned already, Doris, kind of the most well-known of the terms that we use when we're talking about skin microbiome or microbiome in general, which is prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics. And I think when a lot of us are that are listening to this possibly have our own thoughts as to what those terms actually mean, but my gut feeling, given all the conversations I've had over the years, is that we're not all speaking the same language. And this is pretty evident if you look at some of the lawsuits, I think, um, is it Clinique? Yeah, uh, I like the way you describe it. I want you to yeah. give us the definition. Okay. Well, you know, Clinique is going through a lawsuit because of this, and it's because they called uh, one or more of their 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 uh, products probiotic when the lawsuit, the, the plaintiffs are basically claiming that there was no live bacteria that are in the products. And so basically the plaintiffs are claiming that in order for it to be probiotic, in order for us to want to pay a premium for a product, it needs to have live bacteria. Now, again, that is a step in the right direction. But frankly, if we think about what a probiotic is uh, from a scientific perspective, it's not just live bacteria because that could uh, describe a whole lot of things. We could all think of probably a strain or two of live bacteria that we definitely don't want on our skin. Um, you know, and so, I mean, you know, do you want some botulism on your face? I mean, you might want it in your, in your forehead. Today. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, you don't want the, the, the bacteria strain that produces botulism or botulinum toxin on your skin. You want it refined and injected, <laughs> but you know, you know, you don't want MRSA on your skin. You, there, you don't want flesh eating bacteria on your skin. Those are all live bacteria and those would not be considered probiotic. And so then it takes another turn, which you could say, well, okay, it has to be a live bacteria that is good for your skin. 
Well, <clears throat> that's where we also get into kind of a, uh, uh, this is also a nuance here because that's what most companies would say is things like lactobacillus, right? So they're saying that it's a live bacteria um, that is good for your skin, but then that good for your skin part is the part that is uh, debatable. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, is it truly good for the skin? Because, and then so let's, let me read to you um, uh, what a uh, group of scientists um, have deemed as what a probiotic uh, definition should be. And this is in the publication from 2015 called Selective Manipulation of the Gut Microbiota Improves Immune Status in Vertebrates. Uh, and in this, in this uh, publication, the authors state that a probiotic must have the capacity to survive in the relevant area of the body they are to be used in. And so that right there takes the lactobacillus out of the running because while, you know, transiently it could probably survive on the skin, it's not going to be able to survive long term in large amounts and propagate and deliver any type of long term effect on that area of the body, which that being the skin. Second thing here is that those uh, that something that is a wanting to be called a probiotic should be displaying a high resistance to any environmental stressors specific to that location. So on the skin, our skin is typically an acidic pH, and so it has to be able to thrive in an acidic pH. That knocks the Staphylococcus aureus out, which is known to be a pathogenic micro, but it likes actually alkaline, um, more alkaline pHs. And so again, th this is a way to, a, a nuance to the definition that actually is quite important. And then it has to lack any transferable uh, antibiotic resistance genes, has to be able to confer clear benefits to the host, uh, which I think we would all agree with. Everybody probably agrees with that. And then it's non-pathogenic, non-toxic, and provides protection against disease-causing microorganisms by means of multiple inherent mechanisms. So that's a pretty well-rounded and quite descriptive uh, definition of what a probiotic should be, and I agree wholeheartedly. Um, and I'll get your reactions, both of your reactions to that in a second, but let me also read a definition that is actually, so that was a scientific definition. So that's what a scientist would look and say, this is what a probiotic should be considered. Then- So to we, recap that one, it's just a bacteria that can, or well, let's say a bacteria that is natural or can survive in the area and thrive in that area that does good for the area and um, so it's either symbiotic or right. it's it's helpful. And um, and yeah, I think those are the basic tenets of it. It's naturally can be grow there. Right. It's good if it's there, and right. um, and it likes that environment, which does take away most of the gut bacteria that we're talking about when, when applied to the skin. Right. Yeah. 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 And so the, the other ones that are a little bit uh, don't stand out as much, but are very important are lack uh, uh, trans transferable antibiotic resistance genes uh, and are non-toxic, non-pathogenic and provide protection against disease causing microorganisms. So not just, not just that it does good things, but also it prohibits the bad ones from, uh, yes. from hurting us as well. And the antibiotics thing is also very important because we want to make sure that it, it doesn't have uh, the ability to um, adapt bad genes into its, its, its genome and become bad eventually. And that, you know, we can get really into detail there, but we're not going to. What I do want to do is now look at, um, because as we mentioned before, there's no really industry consensus as to what these terms mean. So there was a group, there is a group that put out a report recently called the Report for the International Cooperation on Cosmetic Regulation, <laughs> Microbiome and Cosmetic Survey of Products, Ingredients, Terminologies, and Regulatory Approaches. That's a well, mouthful. they need a shorter name. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, like, that's crazy. Nobody's going to get that. Well, I mean, what organization did you just join? Uh, yeah. <laughs> they need an acronym. Yeah, well, anyway. <laughs> Maybe they should spell it out as probiotic. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but they, they listed um, a lot of these, these terms and this is what they call a probiotic. They call it a live or dormant microorganism. Lac and then they put examples, Lactobacillus casei, Lactobacillus alcidophilus, and Nitrosomonas eutropha. So they've really pared it down and they basically made it the, to where it's a live or dormant microorganism. Again, that doesn't basically, uh, descri that describes, again, the flesh-eating bacteria. It describes yeah. MRSA. So it seems a little reductive. And that's yeah. the, that's kind of the point I'm trying to drive is that we are, 
a lot of the disconnect comes from people trying to be reductive so that they get all the benefit while still trying to stay true to the science, which I don't think is completely possible. We, it's either a probiotic or it isn't. And we have to come to an agreement on what that means. And it can't just be as simple as it's living. What do you think, Doris? I, I think we do need a definition. I'm thinking as you speak about all the other things in skincare where we don't have good definitions and the harm it does. People are looking for natural, they're looking for organic, they're looking for clean. Right. And we don't have good definitions for any of those things. And so people like hearing it. They go, oh, it's clean. Clean what? Is it... it they washed it before they gave it to you. I don't get it. And so it doesn't really have any meaning, but it makes you feel good. And that's what's happening with probiotics. It doesn't really have any meaning, but it makes you feel good. And I, it, the opportunity and the onus is on us creators. And, and I, I think we need to set this right as we start with this new genre and this new disruptor in skincare. But I, I think about when I take care of patients now, I have dropped 99% of my antibiotic use for my acne patients because I've managed to work on their biome mm -hmm. and help them in ways that are much more productive. And I love that I don't need antibiotics as much, not even topical antibiotics as much for, um, for acne. So there's a lot that we can do, but we do need to begin with definitions and boundaries. So I think that we need to, and, and, I, and you and I are working on this, right. of trying to come up with those definitions and, and then get it out to general acceptance. And we just have to be persistent in that voice of when somebody comes up with something that's oversimplifying or overly reductive to say, okay, that's not helpful. We need, to, we need this definition and this is why that we want ones that are non-pathogenic, non-toxic to the area that are um, that are helpful in that area. Like we need to have these definitions that may be annoying to some people, but will also be able to give us this these boundaries where the consumer at the end for, for Angela's work with the consumer and marketing can then say, okay, it has these criteria. Now I know that it is a probiotic and it's gonna be good for me. And when they hear probiotic and they feel good about it, it's going to mean something beyond just the word itself. Right. It's the challenge is simply explaining it without being reductive. Yeah. Because if you look at this quote that we talked about where, she, where this uh, dermatologist says that skincare, I'm um, sorry, live bacteria and skincare is overrated. If we look at the industry definition, I would agree. I would agree yeah. that if you're if all it is is live bacteria and that's all that we know a probiotic to be, I would say I agree it's overrated. But if we go right. by the scientific definition that it's something that lives and thrives on our skin that's good for us, that gets all the pathogens away from us, that produces stuff that is non-pathogenic, non-toxic, that actually makes us look and our skin look and feel better, I would say I absolutely disagree that it's overrated. I'd say sign me up for that. Exactly. And so, <laughs> you know, that's where that's why this is such an important discussion, because if we're not speaking the same language, then you know, it's hard for us to judge these types of comments, because based on what they're calling a probiotic, they might actually be correct. But what I'm calling a probiotic, I think is incorrect. And so what do you think, Angela? What do you, you know, uh, just, I think we can both agree that um, there's a lot of interesting, um, uh, when to topical products are made, there's a lot of interesting things that happen. And there's a, <laughs> there can be a sprinkle of something in a product. Sure. And suddenly you're able to advertise that you have yeah. this ingredient. Yeah. At the end of the day, when I work with medical practices all day long, you know, one of the things I always go back to is your patient didn't walk into this clinic to buy a product or to buy a service. They walked into this clinic for a result. So your yeah. job is to share with them, how do I help you achieve that result? and most likely in the philosophy in which you already live. So when I look at the microbiome, um, you know, if somebody, if, they're, if, if, you're, if you're targeting microbiome care, skin microbiome care, and that's getting results for patients, that's what they're looking for. The mm -hmm. consumer is looking for change. And if you're able to say, show change, then, you know, that's a big part of it. Um, definition or no definition, they're looking for that change. And they're looking for it to match their philosophy. And I think we can all agree that today's 
consumer, savvy skincare consumer, is looking for a more natural approach anywhere they can get it. Doris, would you agree with that? Is that something that you see Completely. Your That's yeah. so well said. It's all your marketing and, and consumer skills shine right there. I totally <laughs> agree. It's just so well said. Yeah, I call her the spin doctor because she can make anything sound good. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> so, you know, Truly. And I think what's so exciting when you're on the brink of a paradigm shift, yep. and in marketing it's referred to as blue ocean strategy, and I don't know, Doris, if you've ever heard that t- term used, but I'll give you just one quick example. In an age where circuses were just about extinct, People weren't wanting to go. There were animal rights activists that were acting out against them. You know, they were dying in the United States. Along comes a little French company to introduce Cirque du Soleil. Mm -hmm. They didn't come into what we call Red Ocean and start fighting their way against the traditional circus acts to suddenly gain prominence. Instead, they went into a completely different ocean, blue ocean, where there were no competitors and did something completely different. And we see where they are today. Right. So, you know, that's the challenge. I think that when you talk about microbiome care, it's like that's the not only the challenge, but the opportunity. And the opportunity is extraordinary that if you can develop the right products with the right um, with the right science behind them and the right messaging that uh, resonates with the consumer. And then you get people like Dr. Doris Day saying, with all my experience in dermatology, I believe this with all my heart and soul, this is the direction we should be going, then you've got the opportunity to, to create Blue Ocean. All right, so let me go through a couple of these other uh, definitions really quick because I do want to get into a little bit of what you're talking about, Angela, which is how do we adjust from the pixie dust kind of mentality that's taken over this whole idea of probiotic skincare? Because I think that's kind of where we are right now is that there's very few, if any, players that have actually gotten the consumer and the medical community to buy in because of the lack of definition consistency as well as a lack of efficacy or story and science behind most of these products. But Or understanding. Or really. understanding as right. well. So this another uh, definition here is prebiotic, which a lot of people think of as just food for the probiotic, right? Um, And so that's actually accurate is that a prebiotic should be something that actually allows a probiotic to thrive. The problem is that a lot of uh, ingredients that are called prebiotic are simply things that feed bacteria. And the problem is they feed both the good and the bad bacteria. And so the the question is, can we really call something that feeds both um, a prebiotic? I mean, it's debatable, right? This is one of the ones that I think is a little more on the fence because it really comes down to if the good one can outcompete the bad one with the same food source, then I guess it's okay. But if they, if it basically, yeah. if you have dysbiosis and you're feeding everything, how does that help you? Um, the other part that I would say with a prebiotic is I, I don't think I, I don't think that the definition that it has to be good for you applies to prebiotics. Okay. I think prebiotics is a general. I think of it, and and I guess it's it, we can kind of duke out what it really means, but I th- I think that basic general definition of it as being what feeds the probiotic. Sure. To me, the probiotic is a hero, and that definition is the most important. So the prebiotic, you know, again, we come to the P acnes or C acnes, and there's different strains. They may all eat the same food, but there's different strains. So the the prebiotic is going to be the same, and it may not only feed what you want it to feed, because I don't, you know, it's like a a serial murderer and a genius eat the same food. Um, (laughs) I guess that's true. Definition. Well, I guess you could, I guess you could argue because Jeffrey Dahmer was a serial killer, and I don't think he eats the same food as we do. Special diet, right? Right, not Jeffrey Dahmer's. I didn't say a cannibal. All right, they don't eat the same food, so there's the exception. Sure, but they're rare. And actually, that's that's um, that analogy is not that far off because um, although you're right for the most part, there the C. acne strains are are some different uh, food sources that the protective versus the pathogenic, they do differ as far as what can be used. So Um, that may evolve. That does, that will evolve. But I think in general, uh, the prebiotic as food, I think is a a fine for now until, until you prove it's wrong, general thing that if there really are distinctions, but I think there's going to be some foods, like maybe not all foods for the the probiotics. And I I think it's going to be really hard to exclude something 
because it feeds um, everything, right? It's, it's yeah. feeding everything. So. Right. And what I would, I would actually argue that I, I think that that's, that's right. And again, there's going to be some disagreement here because again, we're all still learning about what's the most important part of uh, trying to get a probiotic, a true probiotic, you know, um, a skin commensal that is good for us. How do we get that to thrive? How do we choose the right strain? And we'll talk about that in a second. But um, one of the things that I feel passionately about is that you know, if, if you're actually asking a probiotic to live and thrive in any given area, then um, typically it should be uh, there already, right? And so it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those things where you're just trying to foster the growth of something that is good for you that should live there already. So the environment that the skin produces should provide the nutrients that that bacteria already needs. And so you could argue that um, the skin environment should already produce the best prebiotics. However... That could be changed because, for instance, you mentioned as we get older, we produce less sebum and such. And so if that's the food source, we have to understand that so that we can restore some of those food sources that they need. But the way to do that is we have to understand the strains first. We need to know why. Or you can have a genetic deficiency. 100%. Like I'm thinking 100%. of eczema where yep. you, you have specific genetic deficiencies. And so your biome may naturally be deficient. And so you may need to create a biome right. that or restore a biome or, or yeah. So I, I think there's, there's, there's exceptions there as well that you could say in, in healthy skin, you have these biomes that exist. And so you'll make that your norm and not try to mimic. Person. Yeah. Try to mimic that in, in, in people that don't have normative skin types. I, I agree with you. It's just, we, again, we have to learn what does that mean? What does it mean to have normative skin and what does a strain need to thrive? And so I would love to stay on the topic of C. acnes, and so let's put a pin in that because um, we have a, a few more minutes. We have about 10 minutes left, and I just, I just really quickly want to mention a couple of last definitions, and then we can move on. So there's one more that is well-known, which is a postbiotic, and some people have, you know, crassly called that like the waste product or the poop of the bacteria, and that is absolutely not true. I mean, some of it is the metabolites or the waste products of the bacteria, but there's also a lot in a postbiotic, which is... Um, something that the bacteria would provide to make its environment better. So it can spit out antioxidants. It can spit out, you know, short chain fatty acids. Um, also could spit out things like, um, you know, biofilms and such. And so there's a lot of things that bacteria produce that are not waste products. They're actually made to help that bacteria survive in that environment better. And then there's a last definition here that is was new to me when I read it, which is paraprobiotic. And uh, before I would have called a lysate because a lot of times on skincare, you don't really have live bacteria. You have a lysate or you have a ferment product. And um, the ferment product is what we are calling the postbiotic. Yeah. But the lysate, I would have in the past also called it a, a postbiotic because that's kind of, there was no other bucket for it. Um, but this is what a paraprobiotic is, which is a non-viable probiotic cell or the crude cell extract. So basically it's either a dead back, dead probiotic or like think of it as an egg where you crack it open and the insides, uh, you know, the yolk and the albumin, that would be considered the lysate or a paraprobiotic. And so that is actually the ferment product and the paraprobiotic is mostly what is actually what people call probiotic skincare. Mm. To move on to the next topic, which is about what Doris was alluding to before, which is the prescriptive part of this, which, you know, everything we've talked about today kind of boils down to this, which is, okay, we've talked about the problems with kind of what we're call what people have called probiotic skincare, the reasons why this dermatologist is saying it's overrated. And I think it all comes down to because the industry really hasn't provided a solution yet that really makes it to where we wholeheartedly can dive in and say, okay, that's a probiotic for the skin. Um, or that's a, you know, that's what is, you know, uh, the right environment for the skin. And so I think the trends are getting there, but we let's discuss that really quickly. And so anybody that knows me or my work, and you can just Google my name and you're going to see this, is that I've been kind of shouting from the hilltops for years that I believe that the most important microbe that lives on our skin is C. acnes. And this is the microbe that People were saying caused acne, and this is the microbe that people have been trying to get rid of for decades and decades. And so it sounds a little crazy and controversial, but once you start to tease apart you know, what we now know, it becomes absolutely obvious, in my opinion. 
And what else? I'll start the conversation by saying for about six years now, I've been putting billions of C-acnes on my face almost every night, and mm -hmm. I don't have a pimple on my face. So it can't be that C. acne just is blankly going to cause acne, right? Now, this is a much longer and more nuanced conversation that we don't have time to get into all of it. But Doris made the biggest point, which is C. acne has hundreds of strains. And one of the things that we definitely now know as skin scientists is that you cannot universally attribute any given property whether it's pathogenicity or protectiveness or anything to a whole species of microbe. It is very strain specific. Anybody that does, knows gut microbes would know that. It's the same for the skin microbes. And so C. acne has such genetic differences amongst the different subspecies that they've actually had to rename and restructure the whole uh, species because of that. Doris, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, it was an eye opener for me when when we started working on a panel on trying to cure acne instead of just control it, because right now we can only control it and hope that somebody outgrows it. But as I started to learn about the different strains and the benefits of, of acne, so you have to think if something is there and everybody has it, on some levels, you have to find like, is there a reason and, and a benefit to having it? And is eliminating it necessarily the best thing or eliminating the environment that it lives in or what feeds it? And, and we're learning more and more, especially from the amazing work that you've done, that there is a reason that it's there and it does provide benefit, maybe even potentially life-saving benefit. And we need to figure out how to differentiate the different strains and nurture the strains that are doing good and see if we can make the good strains overcome the bad strains and in that way naturally truly naturally treat acne naturally meaning your skin doing it by itself by by redirecting the type of strains that grow in the skin and it, it might be different concentrations for different people. It might be a C. acne transplant for some people. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's so much exciting work to be done here. But getting the dermatology community to understand this, I think is going to be very challenging. And we're going to need a lot of proof. And, and, you know, there's so many products that are designed to specifically knock out C. acnes that it's 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 going to be it's going to be a battle but one I'm ready for and excited about. Right, and I think what you just said hit the nail on the head is we talked at the very beginning of this uh, episode about the fact that we have all these tools in our arsenal that are being misused, but now's our chance to reassess. For instance, you talked about a microbiome transplant, you know, which that is being discussed in in uh, the medical community and in scientific communities, maybe things like antibiotics should be used to, you know, set the stage that we can actually add, curate our microbes. And, you know, yeah. the fact is, again, we're not going to get through this all because we only have a couple more minutes. But, you know, the fact is that everybody has C. acnes. Everybody, every single person in the world, there's evidence that it's even in the amniotic fluid that, we're, that, we, that we basically cook in <laughs> before we're born. And so the thing is, we come preceded with C. acnes. It's going to be there. The question is, we need to understand the nuances of the strains that are on our skin, why they're there, how many should be there. It's not the same on the surface as it is. Which deeper. strains should be there? Yeah. What other microbes are there around it that are yeah. controlling it? Or what are your skin producing, right? What's your skin producing? Are you producing the right amount of sebum, too much sebum, not enough sebum? You know, are we, is it the and what's sweat? what's driving it? A hundred percent. So there's a lot of nuance as to what's good, what's bad, you know, what's ugly, <laughs> you know? And so... I think that we're just getting started, even in this conversation. And, you know, uh, the next podcast I think we have slated uh, is to talk more about acne. And this kind of translates into that as well. Um, you know, so there's so much more, you know, and Doris, you and I, you know, we're, we're constantly talking about this. And I'm sure this isn't the last time we're going to have you on and talk about this topic. No, I want to do the acne podcast, too. All right. Well, <laughs> done. You heard I'm it here, folks. I'm inviting myself back. I'm not <laughs> waiting for the invitation. And everyone hears it now. So unless you edit this out, I'm in. <laughs> nope. It's going it's in. It's a done deal. All right. And so, um, Doris, while we, uh, while we uh, exit here the episode, I do want to remind everybody that Dr. Day does have a live two-hour radio show on Dr. Radio on Sirius XM, uh, channel 110. 
Uh, Dr. Day discusses breaking news and current topics in dermatology. Um, I've been lucky enough to be a uh, guest on her show, and I hope to do so again. Doris, do you have anything else uh, about that that you want to advertise? No, I, I love doing the show. I've been doing it for 14 years. It's a two-hour live call-in show, and love for everyone to listen and call in with questions anytime. It's great, and you're the utmost professional. She's You're mm, one of the, you. the best presenters that I know. Um, Doris, is there any uh, is there anywhere that they can find you that you'd like them to contact you on? I'm on all the social media, whether it's Instagram, my website, uh, LinkedIn, everything, TikTok, Facebook at Dr. Doris Day, Dr. Doris Day. So you can find me on all those different platforms. And I do all my own posting. So it's all me. Oh, my goodness. And you have a lot of people <laughs> following you. So I do not envy you the amount of time it probably takes to follow up on that. But Doris, do you have any final thoughts uh, before we sign off? I think the, the biome and the skin biome is the future of skincare. And I'm so excited about what we're learning and how much we now know that is actionable already and how much is yet to come. And we just exponentially learn more every month, every year. And we're only getting better at this. So stay tuned. There's so much more to come. And our book is going to be just incredible. I mean, I'm so excited about our book because we talk about all these things and then we actually give prescriptives of what you can do at home to, to optimize your skin's biome and help yourself have healthy, beautiful, rejuvenated skin at every age. Because that is my goal as a dermatologist is to improve structure and function, which translates for you and that you look in the mirror and you like what you see. Wonderful. Angela, any last thoughts on this? You know, I would just ask that all who have joined us today, first of all, thank you for joining us today. And, you know, be prepared. We're on the verge of, of a really exciting time in skincare. And there's many times that we have to reset. And be prepared for a reset in the way that you think of skincare today. Be open minded to it. Um, ask the tough questions. Is there a particular strain? of uh, bacteria that could actually be beneficial to our skin? Is there a particular way that we can feed it to really optimize it on our skin? And is there a potential for that particular bacteria, as you said, to spit out you know, things, nutrients to our skin on a 24 seven type of format? Um, and really think about as the science progresses and as technology progresses, you know, be open-minded to the aspect that there could actually be a new way of doing what we've been doing the same way for the last 20 to 25 years. Wonderful. And Angela, where uh -oh. can they find you? I'm at the Crown Aesthetics headquarters in Dallas, Texas, every day of my life, uh, just about. <laughs> and um, I'm on Instagram, slightly. <laughs> at Angela W. McDonald, but at either of those places I can be reached. And, you know, it's just a pleasure being here with you today, Thomas, and of course with Dr. Doris Day. Great to see you, Doris. Okay, and I would encourage anybody listening to go ahead and send us your thoughts. Uh, let us know what you think about the, what we discussed today and anything you think we should discuss regarding this topic in the future. From Media World Studios here in Dallas, Texas, this is the Skin Science Podcast, and I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock. Thank you for your eyes and your ears. We hope you gleaned something from this conversation. If you have questions, comments, or have something you'd like us to cover, please message me on Instagram at dr.t.hitchcock. That's dr.t.hitchcock, H-I-T-C-H-C-O-C-K. And from all of us at Crown Laboratories, remember that skin science is for life. Goodbye for now. Goodbye, everyone.